It's a quarter to ten. Time for Famous for 15 Minutes with Jenny Mills. Intruder in the palace. Intruder at the Queen's bedside. She kept him talking for ten minutes. Gave him a whiskey. Fear over Queen's safety. The Queen, to me, represented all that was just keeping me down and lack of voice. And I just wanted her to know what it feels like to just be an ordinary chap trying to make ends meet. It's the kind of story that shuts up an entire pub full of listeners. The time I sat on the Queen's bed. In the summer of 1982, a more unlikely visitor to the palace could hardly have been found. Michael Fagan was 30, a casually employed painter and decorator struggling to support and care for six children after his wife had walked out. He says it was the strain of this which made him break into Buckingham Palace for the first time on the night of June the 7th. My nerves were pretty bad. They were going up and down. I was, uh, was uh, going through this breakdown. And I'd walked around the streets of London and I suddenly come across Buckingham Palace and I could see the window open. It was, it was there subconsciously to do it, probably. And I just stopped over the wall, up the drain pipe and in. Walked around the palace for about an hour, um, looking at the pictures on the wall, paintings. But it wasn't how I would have imagined it. I don't think people imagine it the way it is. Dusty and squeaky floorboards. Very ordinary. You know, I don't think they spend too much on sort of decoration. You know? Maybe they have it done up now and then. Maybe it was due a redeck. Past a few doors. I came across a throne room when they evidently do the knighthoods in there and whatever. Went in there, that was quite interesting. So I had a little sit on the throne. I'm walking about willy-nilly, actually. I'm not hiding. Didn't you see any security staff? No, no, not up to now, not up to this point. Went into Prince Charles's private secretary's office, I found out later. And um, there's all these presents around the walls presents that people send in from the far reaches of the globe, you know, sort of teddy bears and cups. And uh, there was this bottle of wine from California. And I was so thirsty and I couldn't find a tap. I didn't actually intend to steal anything. Took the bottle down from the shelf and I couldn't find a corkscrew. I was sitting on the desk with my feet up. Pushed the cork into the bowl and drank it out of the bottle. And then all of a sudden I thought, my God, where am I? I'm in Buckingham Palace. Oh, no. What am I doing here? I mean, it was just like... It was, as if my brain had arrived in a TARDIS. To, it was, just, you know, how do I get out? So as I walked out into the passageway, I saw a security guard with a dog and I looked round the corner and I stood back, he went into a room and I found my way out then, I made my way downstairs out the window, across the, the, the grounds at the back and over the wall and I'm walking up the mall five minutes later and I thought, as I got to sort of towards Nelson's column I thought, my God, I've been in Buckingham Palace no, can't have been back in Paris. Fagan's mental breakdown gathered speed. His wife had come and taken the children away. Trying to find out where she'd gone, he had a violent row with his 14-year-old stepson. Then, believing that his wife was heading for the Hippies' Midsummer Festival at Stonehenge, he stole a Ford Cortina to follow her. He ran out of petrol, was spotted by the police, and eventually arrested. At the time of the second palace break-in, he was on bail. In the early hours of July the 9th, he found himself again in the Mall. I think I knew what I was doing at that point. Started walking towards Buckingham Palace. About five o'clock, I see all these women cleaners going to work. The intense there now, I'm going to sit, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to see the Queen. One direction, nothing's going to stop me. Through St James Park, up over the wall, into the palace, saying good morning to the servants as I'm walking past them. I don't know how the hell I found a room. I really don't know. People have said to me, you know, how did you find it out of all those rooms? I really don't know. 
I'm in the Queen's bedroom, so to make sure it's a Queen, I walked to the window, because she's looking very small in her bed. She was asleep, was she? Yeah. Walked past her bed. It looks too small to be the Queen, so go go over, and I draw the curtain back, just to make sure. And suddenly she sat up. What are you doing here? So I said... Well, I was dumbstruck, to be honest. And I just... I was thinking what to say. And she, get out, get out. And she jumped out of bed. What are you doing here? And walked out of the room. So I stood there. Maybe I sat on the corner of the bed, all this about long conversations. I mean, a lot has been said about what went on in that room. This is the truth, you know. Nothing was... She just said, get out, and that was it. The footman came in. He, he said to me, you look like you need a drink, mate. If you come over here, I'll pour you, pour you a drink. Two policemen come up. One of them said to me, well, what's your name then, son? And the other one nodded in agreement as if to say, that's fine, that's the question you ask. So I, I said, my name's um, Michael Hess. And I carried on. I said, um, my father's Rudolf Hess, and he's in Spandau. And they looked at each other and say, oh, my God, what we got here? So I just, just think there was a rebellion going on in my head. Do you think you were actually trying to get caught when you went in that second time? Yeah. Yeah. Just to make that statement of, you know, I am. I am. Michael Fagan, the man who entered the Queen's bedroom at Buckingham Palace ten days ago, won't be prosecuted for it. He appeared at Bow Street Magistrates Court in London to face charges for entering Buckingham Palace five weeks earlier and stealing a half bottle of wine worth three pounds. About the visit to the Queen, the Director of Public Prosecutions took the view that there was no evidence of any state of mind on the part of the defendant which would render his trespass a criminal offence. I was actually charged with stealing half a bottle of wine. It was just unbelievable, actually, to be tried at number one court, Old Bailey, the hanging court. It intimidated me. I mean, people have been sent to Australia from there. They've been sent to the gallows from there. And there's me for half a bottle of wine. Good evening. It took a jury at the Old Bailey just 14 minutes to find Michael Fagan not guilty of entering Buckingham Palace and stealing a bottle of wine. Fagan, who's 30 and unemployed, had denied the charge. But he freely admitted in the witness box that he'd been inside Buckingham Palace, taken a swig of Prince Charles's wine and had a look at the Royal Art Collection. He said he'd done it all to show that security at the palace was lax. They were doing psychiatric reports on you. Did that worry you? No, not at all. No one would talk to me for real. The psychiatrist, no one would actually sit down and listen to me. So I came out with things that would actually make people listen to me. The Queen, and possibly some other people, would be in danger if Michael Fagan, the man who twice broke into Buckingham Palace, were allowed to run free, the head of Broadmoor Special Hospital said yesterday, giving evidence at the Old Bailey. Michael Fagan, the man found in the Queen's bedroom at Buckingham Palace, has been sent to a secure hospital in Liverpool. The doctors will have to decide when it's safe for him to go free. Making the order, Judge James Miskin said this was neither a punishment nor a sentence. Fagan, he said, would be received at the hospital as a patient, not as a criminal. Immediately after the trial, Fagan released a statement saying, I love Her Majesty the Queen. I have the deepest respect for her. I would do nothing to embarrass her. I was actually handed a section 60, which is I need two psychiatrists to let me go. An unending sentence. If they just give me 12 years at the old Bailey, I could have thanked them very much because I'd know there was an end to it. But they didn't. They, they gave me an open-ended sentence. I was absolutely terrified. I just wanted to get out and see my children. I'm being kept away from my children. I was sad every night. I used to think of them every night. And that hurt. I got through with my sense of humour. I drove the staff absolutely raving bonkers. They were so glad to see the back of me in the end. 20th of January, 1983. Michael Fagan freed. Mental Health Tribunal releases Palace Intruder. The decision to release him followed an appeal to the Mental Health Tribunal for the Mersey region. However, the chairman said in a statement last night that Fagan was not fully recovered. 
As MPs challenged the decision to release him, Michael Fagan declared, It has all been a great adventure. He would only add, I've had a tiring day and I just want to be left alone with my family. He was speaking through the letterbox of his mother-in-law's flat in Edmonton. But that wasn't the end of Michael Fagan's brushes with the media or the law. I can tell you I went through quite a hard time with the authorities. They were not happy with me. 24th of July, 1984. Michael Fagan was remanded in custody for three weeks, charged with assault and causing a disturbance after a fracas in a beach cafe. Fagan accused of obscene jig. Michael Fagan, 37, denied obscenely exposing himself to a woman by dancing a jig with no trousers on in Chingford. Harassed Fagan assaulted boy. I went away three or four times after that, for people coming up to me saying, who do you think you are? And there was a few fights. I went to prison twice for that, for fighting, just defending myself. You know, it was just, this is the way the establishment gets you. And um, power to the establishment. And I'm telling you what, I've, I've learned I've learned a lot of respect for it. You've got to respect it, because it can have you when it wants you, mate. I can honestly say that I've just gone strong with it, because the more you beat someone down, the more they're going to come back. And certainly, Michael Fagan isn't the kind of man to fade quietly from the public eye. He even made a record, a version of the Sex Pistols song, God Save the Queen. God Save the Queen. A lovely human being. What future can I dream? Don't tell me what I want. Don't tell me what I need. Who planted the man in? News of the World, 23rd of April, 1989. I say, I say, it's the Palace Intruder Cabaret. Palace prowler Michael Fagan last night sparked a new storm. He was billed as the star guest at Leighton Labour Club's Beer Festival in East London. During his cabaret act, the former mental patient tells how he broke into the Queen's bedroom. People will come up to me in the pub and they'll say, you're the bloke that broke into the palace, aren't you? I don't go, I never, ever chat up girls with that line. Never. I use it for fun. I use it for a laugh, but I don't use it as a chat up line. I had a friend. He used to use a chat up line. Oh, guess who this is? And, and I, I've, I've had that before, and I actually look over my shoulder, because I think they're actually talking about someone else. I don't sort of... Oh, and they say, that's Michael Fagan. So you've got no regrets or no conscience about having done it? I, I actually do have regrets, yeah. My father had a heart attack over it because he took so much stress over it. Yeah, I do have regrets. Michael and his wife were eventually divorced. He was granted custody of the children and is still a full-time father, doing the occasional decorating job to make ends meet. He's now a grandfather too. The children are more important to him than anything else. They love me and they, they just think I'm their dad and I'm brave and strong and fearless. And that's what dads are supposed to be. Sarah's in her first year of school and someone said, that her dad broke into Buckingham Palace. And she just turned around and said, yeah, and your dad hasn't, has he? How much do you enjoy the notoriety of it? I'd be quite happy if it hadn't have happened. So you didn't do it for the 15 minutes of fame? No, not really. You can have the crack with it, as the Irish say, you know, you can... You mean it makes a good story? It's a good story, yeah. And I, I've met people from all over the world, and they're fascinated by the story. I was talking to a fellow from Turkey yesterday, and he'd read it in his paper. I mean, all over the world people read it. I think everyone's got a story to tell. Mine just sort of like is the story that went worldwide. Famous for 15 Minutes is presented by Jenny Mills and produced at Pebble Mill by Sarah Rowlands. Next week, at the same time, Jenny Mills talks to Barbara Edwards, Britain's first television weather woman. But shooting Archbishop Romero while he's saying mass and killing six of the most distinguished Jesuits in the world in one swell poop. One swell poop, even! <laughs> one fell swoop. <laughs> That among, among your colleagues you become a star overnight. Mm. That blood is glamorous. But who did the offering? Who guided and advised the soldiers in their endeavours? Who nurtured them? Jose Maria Tajira, the present rector of the Central American University, brackets, 
where the Jesuits were killed, close brackets, said that William Walker, the U.S. ambassador in, in El Salvador at the time of the massacres, in some way knew what was going on, hindered a, the investigation. A human rights worker added, the U.S. is the missing protagonist protagonist in the case. It sure is. These are Harold Pinter's words, of course. Mm. It has now been established that half an hour before the Jesuits were murdered, with the Archbishop, of course, President Christiani attended a Salvadorian Army briefing, at which two or three officers, US officers, were also present. This is no great surprise. There were plenty of United States officers present present through the whole enterprise. They were known as advisors, experts in, experts in the field.